Hello, everybody, and welcome to Table Takes. Today is February 5th. It is actually February this time, and I'm not thinking about the future. And hey, guess what? I heard something exciting. I hear, Derek, you're going on an adventure. Yeah, an adventure, that adult <laughs> ritual of passage where you have to completely freak out and pull out your hair and wake up early and tour a bunch of houses uh, and see if you get any of them. So that's it's that's great. my plan for tomorrow. Yeah, we, we've we've made a big long list of houses that look awesome, that are probably way outside our budget, that we will probably get outbid on, and we are desperately trying to not become emotionally attached to them until mm. we actually hear we're getting them. And that is a losing battle, I will admit. So, yeah. I mean, I guess the house you would have to take is the one that's hot, like, you know, have a family of raccoons in there, I'm pretty sure, right? Okay, so don't joke, because if we had a house with a family of raccoons in it, Nellie would absolutely want to take that house. She has, been, <laughs> she has been bugging me to let her get a raccoon or a possum or an armadillo or some oh. weird-ass animal as a pet, and I have to explain to her. This is great. This is a her. good competitive advantage. The realtor is going to be like, yeah, it's infested with raccoons and squirrels and stuff, and you're like, mm-hmm, yeah, that's real bad. Uh, yeah, so that's going to drop that's the price, true. right? Yeah, yeah just don't tell them that you're down with the raccoons. You're like, all right, I'll, I'm going to deal with this, like, oh, I have to feed them, like a pack of them? Oh, oh that's a lot to deal with. You got to, like... Yeah, but they're going to steal my dice and stuff. Emma, you understand. You don't want raccoons <laughs> running around your game supplies un unsupervised. They're they do have those or... hands. Yeah, see? They might yes. become friends and steal other people's dice and bring them back to my house. So I find a little nest and it's all the dice that they collected. Or they become super friends and they present me with dice. I'm like, I don't know where you got this, but it's mine now. I am now immediately suspicious of any raccoons I see as being <laughs> Emma's minions out in the world to steal her shiny things. Oh, where do you think I get so many dice? Oh. Ooh. I, I would have guessed Kickstarter, but apparently I was wrong. <laughs> it's, it's the raccoon cult. So uh, that's my so, plan for tomorrow. Well, I hope, I wish you luck and hope for a family of raccoons that you can turn into your cult. <laughs> so, you know, this, there's hope in a cult of raccoons. Uh, what about you, Emma? What have you been uh, watching, looking out on lately? Uh, I've been watching a lot of TV which I know is a normal human activity, but it's nothing I do a lot of. It's really cutting into my World of Warcraft time, but it's been great, despite that fact. Uh, WandaVision, I watched, I'm watching a TV show once a week now when it is released, which I haven't mm -hmm. done in like 20 years. So it's a, it's a shock to my system, but it's fun. I'm enjoying it. And WandaVision is super great. And I don't want to spoil anything if you haven't seen it, but I'm really enjoying it uh and also on disney plus just going back and watching some of that good old boy meets world because yeah oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> r.i.p i, I who I, wait r.i.p who died uh from boy meets world isn't uh uh Be Be beekman beekman died right beekman what? No, wait, who am I thinking? Oh my gosh, you just combined like five things. No, are, are you thinking of Saved by the Bell and Shriek? Oh, that's who I'm thinking of. Sh Saved by the... <laughs> Saved what? by the shriek. The range of emotions that I went through being like, who in Boy Meets Street. World just died? Beekman's death? <laughs> the range of crises that I went through. Oh my god. Oh, I'm sorry. I just. Leave of relief where I was like, oh, Screech. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Wait, no. It's awful that he died. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, here. Welcome to the, you know, my brain gets muddled. It's, 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 you know, okay. crazy work. <laughs> uh yeah but, but yeah um I, I haven't been feeling great so just sitting on the sofa i think i watched like seven hours of it last night and it's great to just like, i did that last summer over the summer i watched boy meets world uh because my friend and i were having a debate that uh if uh i'm sorry what's his name um sean and angela are uh -huh. a better couple or couple than um cory and topanga uh-huh uh and Definitely Sean and Angela are a superior couple. Corey is a monster. Oh, Corey yeah. Oh, yeah. Like Topanga. He, like, lies to her constantly. Yeah. She had a full ride scholarship to Harvard, and he guilt trips her yeah. out of that to get married to him. It's a wild... When you watch it, you watch that and Saved by the Bell with fresh 2021 eyes. It's so messed up. There's oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I feel 
guilty. I'm like kind of guilt watching this and there's definitely problems with it, but it also <laughs> tricks my like amygdala animal brain into like just nostalgia. So my nostalgia and my moral sensibilities are warring and it's a very strange feeling. But yeah, Corey is a horrible, horrible person. Yes, um, absolutely, 100%. <laughs> Topanga is amazing. and She is, and he wears her down. He does. She, she's, yeah. like, a really cool radi- radical, like, feminist, like, oh, not rad femme, but, like, a really cool, open-minded, hippie kind of a chick. And yeah. then by the end of it, she's just, like, a nagging, exhausted wife. And it's so sad. Yeah. So sad. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> oh yeah just go on that nostalgia track and also you know isabella you you're doing some personal care if uh i see correctly right is it is it care uh it, it's something it's more than i do <laughs> it's more personal than, investment maybe personal <laughs> investment okay yeah um so yeah no i started uh exercising uh this week and taking more attention to my diet and exercise and whatnot and i'm so hangry um i'm so hungry my god i haven't had a carb in uh over a week and which is gonna be broken because i don't have much time today between this and the next thing so i'm gonna order takeout today which is all your fault Derek. it's all your fault sure I'm yeah, yeah I'm definitely now uh and uh cheat day right cheat day it's thing. gonna be a cheat day but i'm i'm fully invested you know 2020 i spent most of it like a lot of people on the couch inside not doing anything in my pajamas mm. um in a sort of uh stasis and I decided then in 2021 that I was going to, regardless of what was happening in the world, that I was going to take uh, control of, of my my own health and my own fitness and still try to um, be active um, and uh, get back to, you know, I'd like to, my goal is to get back to pre-pandemic shape. That's my goal. But, but ultimately, I would like to surpass that and be uh, in the best shape of my life because you're only as young as you are now. Um, so, so yeah, it's a new thing. Um, if you see me next week and I'm downing an entire short stack of pancakes, don't, (laughs) don't say anything. Don't even, don't just. We can't even congratulate you. It's keto. It's keto pancakes. (laughs) Keto pancakes. Fine. Yeah, the keto pancakes, which taste like, like flat egg. Um, you can make it with bug protein. Excuse me? Oh Yeah. yeah. Like cricket, cricket flour. My 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 uh, partner went keto for a little while, and I experimented with bugs. You're you're telling me this to improve the taste? Apparently, it does. It's not. It's okay. So, like, depending on the bug, all right. I've eaten a lot of bugs. Depending on the bug, it either tastes like nuts, off crab, or off shrimp. Like those are the three combinations you get. It's not. It's not a super appealing menu selection. It's not appealing. But but Gotta nuts. It, t- it could taste like nuts. Oh, and no. it tastes like nuts. You no, know, I, nut nut flour exists too. You can just use a flour that is composed of nuts. I just I've never in my life desired uh, pancakes, and I've eaten them, and I've said, you know what, this could use more crunch, <laughs> more, more of a nutty, crunchy flavor. I've never crabby flavor. That. Don't forget the crab. <laughs> never <laughs> crab and shrimp. Some bugs of the sea. No, I I've never desired that. But thank you, bugs. I, I will take that into some sort of account. Um, the protein of the future. So other than other than eating yes. bugs, Bonsai, what have you been doing lately? <laughs> oh, for no me, I, I guess like so. Basically, uh, my other half has gotten into this like trip of like like things you can do by yourself, role playing games, and so he bought us uh, top ten games you can play in your head by yourself. And apparently he's like, it's really good. It's like guided meditation, and there's like a lot of fun scenarios. You're just kind of like just sitting there, uh, like thinking of things. Some of the adventures that you could do is. Adventure, space, dungeon, trucks, which is apparently like the most like one that people like. You're a truck driver in your head and you have to make these stops and there's a lot of choices to be done. Uh, The Visitor, the Alamo, Murder Night, Your Job, uh, Chess, and Another Life. So it's just a bunch of scenarios that they kind of like, here's your scenario, think it through 
and then just sit there and it's like guided uh, so, ma- imagination i was just gonna say you, that yeah guided imagination you 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 bought a book uh you bought a book to walk you through how to think about your job as a game like is, <laughs> yes. isn't that just isn't that just life as it is like no but it's exciting because it's not and it's just your fantasy it's just like mind fantasy okay. and, and stuff it's it's cool it's like you know how like it tries to unlock your childhood you know when you like played make-believe in your head Sure. You know, there you go. Sure. Yeah. That's that's no, what I, we I think that's awesome. It's the same as a lot of uh, the solo RPGs, uh, solo journaling games that you might actually write down or you might just play in your head. I mean, there's a zeitge- there's a re uh, when is is this book older, newer? Like this is actually style, an but... old. This is old that is okay. being reprinted again, and yeah. it's just like something that's kind of been hidden. And they're like, oh, like a popular like YouTube gaming group was like, well, what's this? Let's reprint this. And everyone's like, have you played games by yourself in your head? This is this is this is the stuff, man. Just yeah, so it, it's it's the same as what a lot of people are doing with uh, a lot of the Zine Quest stuff and solo RPGs and stuff. So it's I, I get. So it. are, are you going to stream it then? You can stream it live. What this? So solo games you can play in your head. No, because you have to think. You don't say anything out loud. This is a thinking game. You do this by yourself. But there are solo games that are pretty fun that you can do that I've been thinking about playing, but mostly my other half is like, no, no, let me take over your stream. You can take a day off and I will play with the stream. He basically wants an excuse to geek out, but not actually make his own channel. <laughs> so that's pretty much what, what it is. Okay. <laughs> we'll take All over right. for a little while. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's basically what we're getting hyped about. And you know what else uh, is pretty hyping, Derek? Mm, you know? Yes. That, that a lot of people who, who maybe love Avatar are getting mm-hmm. hyped about. Sure. Tell us about it, Derek. Well, so uh, once all of the elements were in balance and then the Fire Nation attacked and we lived a long darkness where we didn't have an Avatar tabletop RPG. And now we do, or soon we will, because Magpie Games... Uh, who is known for the? They're doing the tabletop uh, RPG adaptation of Root that should be coming out soon. They also released Bluebeard's Bride, uh, Masks, uh, a bunch of Powered by the Apocalypse games, uh, many of which are very, very well received. So they've got a pretty good pedigree of producing great games. They have announced that they have the license for the Avatar: The Last Airbender tabletop RPG, and that will also include. Legend of Korra content, so it's not just limited to the original animated series. Um, they've announced a few details. They've talked about some of the staff. It is noteworthy that all of the names that I've seen pop up as creators who are involved are all of Asian descent of one kind or another, so it looks like they're going to have great representation. Um, Daniel Kwan, who's on Asians Represent, uh, Sharang Biswas, who we've had on previously with... Um, some D&D projects in the past, uh, but I know that he's very prolific with a bunch of other work as well. And then James Mendez Hodes, uh, I believe is either like the lead or is the currently the most prominent designer involved. So it, it's really exciting to see this product that people have been wanting in tabletop RPG for for a long time get announced. And it's then sati- doubly satisfying to see it backed up with uh, some creators who are going to have a chance to shine and kind of create something that really speaks to their experience yeah very cool i the one question i have because also i'm a longtime fan of avatar mm-hmm. and cora me too uh is that why didn't they do this before because they did such a good world building like mm-hmm. kind of aspect and it's not just like hey if you're an earthbender waterbender like you you know you get you also have a whole a bunch of elite characters of chi blockers of mm-hmm. people that know how to combat without having super cool like well element bending powers kind of thing so Mm -hmm. uh yeah it's just like i don't like i feel i'm very excited uh to see how they like do the various different worlds and i'm just surprised that like the airbender last airbender rpg wasn't already a thing already so yeah it's interesting you if you poke around you can definitely see a lot of games that have come out that Mm. were heavily inspired by the last airbender like i have there's legend of the elements i think yeah, Legend of the Elements is a power by the Apocalypse game that tried to take the idea and run with it, not using the world, obviously, because they didn't have the license, but they took the the thrust of it and basically 
created a rule set you could use just in that world if you really wanted to. Um, so I can only imagine that for whatever reason, no licensing deal was previously struck. Uh, licensing well, IPs it's also for tough it, yeah. to make a really good RPG in an existing IP. Uh, I've talked about this a lot, Alien, right? Like the way oh. that they put that together, we played that on stream multiple times, mm -hmm. the way they really captured cinematic and you being able to kind of play a character, but within this divine space, I think IP role-playing games have had more and less success with this, making something, you know, some have been, just haven't felt like you can't, you don't have enough control or it doesn't feel enough like the world. So, um, I mean, this is a great group of people. I think they're gonna do a great job, but it's definitely something, it's not just as easy as just, oh, it's just slap an IP on uh, Powered by the Apocalypse or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Powered mm -hmm. by the Apocalypse in particular is a, a game system that can do a lot of different kinds of games, but it does take an actual fair amount of work to really tune yeah. that system to support that particular game. And that's, I, I'm a huge fan of the system in general. Um, so I'm always curious. I kind of just collect ones as they come out because it's always interesting to see how the system is tweaked and how the choices are presented to really get the message across. But I do also think it's going to be perfect for Avatar because so yeah. much of that story was, uh, it was not really like, will they succeed? It was very much, how? what will their victory cost them and how will it change them? Ooh. And yeah. I Ooh, really yeah. feel like that question is what the whole Power by the Apocalypse system really like laser focuses on and does a very good job of supporting. So I'm super excited to see what this group of creators will do what they'll do in the world, like where they'll explore it. Uh, I kind of feel like I need to go back and revisit the world a little bit um, because I, I heard a friend, um, a friend of mine read the comics and said the comics are actually really good. Yeah, and I had kind of the skipped on them. And, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. I had just assumed that they weren't going to be super great. Uh, and apparently I missed out. So I kind of want to go back and check them out again and, and get back into the world. And I don't think I ever finished Korra and I really need to sit down and do that because it was a lot of fun along the way. I know there's just like, yeah, I would also recommend the comic books. Uh, I, I do a lot of like, I read comic books and then I go through a lot of like various different blogs and stuff like discussing what happened. And I will tell you if you're a really good fan of Zuko, uh, kind of parenterage, uh, it, it definitely lays some really good foundations to that going into Legend of Korra um, kind of thing. So it's fixed. So who, who wants to play the campaign where we just play Azula and her friends and and we do their adventures around the world. So oh this, my is, goodness. this is supposed yeah. to come out February 2022. Um, mm -hmm. And apparently they already have supplements planned for August of 2022 and February of 2023. So it sounds like they have kind of a multi-year plan to deploy this. They're spending a lot of time making sure that Root does really well. So, you know, I'm hoping that and I, I'm expecting that Magpie is going to do a really good job on this. All right. Well, on other news that we're very excited about that some uh, particular age range is very excited about is Agretsuko. She's getting a uh, a, a Regan, Reg, 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 gosh, sorry, Renegade Studios has basically announced a, an Agretsuko work slash rage balanced game. Uh, so it's going to be a fast paced non collectible card game based on, of course, Agretsuko, and it basically has it as you as this panda, and you have to get rid of your cards, which represent, like, the amount of work you have to do. And if you are the one with the more cards in your hand, you have to basically deal with all of your co-workers, what I like to call shiitake mushrooms. So uh, <laughs> if you don't want to be covered in all the shiitake mushrooms that your co-workers are giving them out, then you try to pass it out so you don't have to do overtime. Uh, it's available March 3rd. Uh, the card game will consist of like five days of work representing uh, the five hands of a play. And uh, you got to complete your work and head over home to play, you know, get all the cards out of your hand or else you have overtime. And that means you just have to stay around while you're smiling and slowly going rageful in the inside. <laughs> uh, but yes, so if you're excited about it and you happen to be a really big fan of Agretsuko, uh, the retail price is looking to be about $20 and the game itself, three to six players. So, hey, if 
if you're a fan, go ahead and check it out. I don't know if everybody has has watched. If you haven't seen Agretsuko, it's a series on Netflix. It's from Japan. Uh, and it's under the actually the Sanrio's. Agretsuko is a Sanrio character, um, uh, like Hello me. Kitty, but <laughs> she instead of being targeted towards like all ages or like younger people like Hello Kitty, Agretsuko uh, is targeted more towards like working adults, uh, is particularly working adult women. And it's all about this red fox, red fox? No, raccoon. Red panda. Um, red panda. Um, uh, who uh, works in an office and she's treated uh, not so well uh, by her co-workers uh, and she's like a normal human being. I've watched every single episode. I think they're on season three um, and she's just like a young woman who's trying to figure out her life. It's probably, and I will say this with with no hyperbolic, hyperbolic, I am really- Hyperbole? Yeah hyperbole i'm like i feel so confident when it <laughs> and it tricks me into believing like yeah you're right i'm like i'm high off of like it's it's black history month and i'm like yeah you're right um so uh, hyperbole about the fact that this is probably one of the most like honest and realistic de- depictions of being a young woman entering into adulthood that I've seen, even though it's all about like animated uh, animal characters, it honestly has really a really uh, honest, truthful portrayal of what it feels like to to be in your early twenties and trying to figure out what it is to be an adult. And so I love it. Also, okay, if you haven't seen it, I will explain one other thing is that when she gets very angry and she needs stress relief, her favorite thing to do is that she goes to a karaoke bar and she sings death metal mm. uh, mm-hmm. and it's adorable. Mm-hmm. Uh, she sings about her day and her coworkers and death metal voice. And it's the cutest thing ever. Uh, and I love her so much. And this is really interesting because at first when I heard about this, I was like, I don't want to play a card game about the trauma of being a working adult. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> This is what I do to escape the trauma of being, because uh, when Agretzko came out, I was working like in an office as a secretary and it was it was spot on for, for my life. Um, but this is really cute. I think that if you're a fan of Agretzko, then you should, this is like a collector's item, I feel like. This is something that you can do with your office, other office workers uh, when you're done with working at the office and you want to have some stress relief, which I think is really, it's really cute. It's so cute. I keep trying to get my wife to watch it because she loves cute things. And mm-hmm. I think she is just beginning to realize that she might like metal because she okay. likes, she's realized that she likes really angry music, mm. uh, which is a pretty good fit. Uh, so I keep wanting to get her to watch it. Uh, and maybe I'll have I to push on, that, push on that again. What, is, what are her reservations? Uh, she's cheap? lazy and she's already watching <laughs> wow. Nine, basically. Like this, that's it's literally too lazy it. to watch. <laughs> it's not reality TV. If it was The Bachelor, she would have it up on the TV. Wow, right now. call her out. <laughs> I'm sure she she's all over she the likes. Bling Empire, right? <laughs> Oh, the Bling Empire. Let's not get started on that. I'm so yeah, no, don't no worry. Feelings <laughs> about that show. <laughs> wow, so, it's so problematic. I mean, I mean, Isabella, do you also have other feelings about, you know, are you a man of a puppet or a puppet of a man? <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow, wow, sirs. Um, so uh, I don't know if everybody saw this. I definitely missed uh, this news um, because I think I've been really preoccupied with other um, uh, large-breasted gaming news that happened earlier um, last week uh, with my dear Lady Demiscrescu, uh, however you pronounce that from Resident Evil. But there's more big-breasted news. Uh, Also, if you have little ones, maybe, um, you know, what do you do with children? Throw a ball, get them to go into another room, make a sandwich and throw it into another room. (laughs) them to tell care <laughs> that's what you do with children right that's what i do with my cat um so wizard of the coast is coming out with a six-part limited series uh on their youtube uh, not on their youtube but on on youtube uh which is called the stuff of legends which is basically taking a game that they have with uh i'm sorry six people five people um and five people four people i'm sorry um, and doing part of the game in real life, just like you've seen a million different times, 
on online, but then also part of it is played by their puppet alter egos. Now, if you're a person of a certain age, uh, like I am, you probably grew up in the 80s, which had a huge uh, puppissance, as they call it, uh, where there were a lot of <laughs> movies that came out in the Jim Henson era that had puppets in them. So I have a very soft spot in my heart. Uh, the controversy came out not necessarily about the use of puppets, but about the presence of one puppet in particular, whose name is Areola Borealis, which is the best name ever. Um, <laughs> and she is a puppet who has uh, two very large assets, um, uh, namely <laughs> big felt gazongas. Um, a couple of names that people have used for uh, her depiction uh, is um, uh, felt floppers, uh, sesame slammers, uh, <laughs> fraggle racks, Henson hooters, uh, and my personal favorite, puppet sweater puppets. Um, so <laughs> um, she, she has very large boobs, and people were um, people. People had a lot of thoughts and feelings about the depiction of this character. There's been a lot of history of women um, being used in fantasy media and not having accurate um, coverings for them, not having accurate armor, uh, being sexed up and having their armor that basically is just chain me metal bikinis. Um, and there were kind of two kind of thoughts about it. I personally thought that it was hilarious, um, but the more that I delved into it, the more that I kind of understand that this has a larger conversation to be had about the depiction of women in media and about how we feel about that. And uh, Emma, I wanted to ask you about your feelings um, about this uh, whole felt uh, mommy milker controversy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think the way that it was presented by wizards through the official Dungeons and Dragons wizards Twitter was this image and especially the way it was cropped you know it's an image of puppets and it's like hey we're doing a new show and then you click on that image and just the way the character was framed of like boobs in your face like <laughs> it's like and there's boobs uh and, and I think for a like, surprise uh, yeah surprise was, boobs yeah <laughs> I like, I, I know with a lot of the Kickstarters and stuff that we go through, I, I've definitely got an eye towards like, hey, is this like 50 different types of like cool dudes, like big dudes, small dudes, muscly, scrawny, like all represented. And then like the one woman who's basically all breasts and no clothing. Uh, it's definitely something I've become sensitized to. So like seeing that image without the context, like the context, you know, that the woman chose this character, that it was a black woman choosing to portray herself this way came afterwards. Uh, so that my, my main feeling is kind of like, I, I think they could have done a lot better job of presenting this because there is a difference in the context, you know, Wizards being a company that's mostly white dudes and has a history of just showcasing art that is just a sexy lady for the male gaze yeah. um like they do have that history in that context so i think what definitely what i would have preferred is like more like hey like we are doing this um there there's a difference if it is a woman choosing herself to portray this way as opposed to like a man choosing to portray a woman this way right and so like to add some more con con uh, context to this uh shannon Mac malcolm who's one of the players chose the depiction of her own character and decided that the character that she wanted to have, which I think the quote is uh, to have the biggest boobs uh, you can possibly put on a puppet. Yeah. Um, and that was her decision to have the character. So a lot of people from what I'm seeing, uh, and maybe Emma, you felt this way, uh, you were putting that more in the context of what Watsky has done in the past yeah. uh, and their depiction overall and the context of the culture overall. Um, but you would wish that maybe they had put more of like, listen, this woman of color has yeah. decided that this is how she wants to be depicted. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is not, this is her autonomy, her making her own choices. And yeah. if they had put that in front instead of sort of like leading with that, 
uh, you know, or not leading with that, but sort of like doing that after the fact that it would have probably maybe in some sort of small way assuaged the kind of controversy. I hate to use the word controversy because we're talking about public yeah, yeah. news. <laughs> <laughs> I think and, what this, oh no, go ahead. If you, no, no, go ahead. So the way that I take a lot of this is that right now in, at least in the United States, we're going through a very big cultural shift with people recognizing problematic behaviors beforehand and then comparing, but also having this uh, dynamic shift of people saying, hey, we've been told not to be over-sexualized because, you know, a proper person or a proper uh, lady in this case uh, does not show off the, like, you know, show herself off. It's, it's like something that like, it's a controversy because there are people who are like, hey, you know, um, it is like, you know, the, what is the line between your power, your choice versus objectifying yourself? I think that's just more of the, like the bigger issue with it. And so um, it, it's more like we have to recognize, yes, there were problematic like, behaviors before that there are changing, but we also have to recognize that individual people, as long as it is their choice in the mm -hmm. matter yeah. to represent themselves and, you know, be their own person in their own comfort and not be objectified by somebody else is like the real controversy because people are like, oh, you know, other hundred, they're like, we gotta, we fix things. But also sometimes right. the things like growing up, I wanted to be like the CEO lady and like all leather riding a motorcycle and then just coming out <laughs> and being like in my skin tight suit. Like this is a business woman in my brain and my like 10 year old mind was like, this is the that's, woman I'm gonna be. That I'm sounds be badass. Honestly, if, if my boss <laughs> rolled up in all leather on a motorcycle, I, <laughs> that would be really Cool. That's that like in my image as a kid that is like, yeah, that's that's the that's the powerful woman. She's an all leather and the CEO of the company riding a motorcycle. Um, but yeah, so it's just like a lot of that kind of mindset of like balancing yeah. between yeah. there. So and it's tough because like I do all, like I struggle with this emotion. Like I want that world so bad. Like I want the world where I can show up, you know, just presenting myself super sexy in the game space in my career space mm -hmm. and um like where I, I can do that and feel like accepted for that like yeah. for a lot of women you know that that's the hard part it's like we do want to do that and we've held ourselves back for the waves of feminism I, I won't get them right so I won't talk about that but it's uh <laughs> you know just like this um conflicting like desire to be accepted in yeah. the existing society and desire to portray ourselves in a way that we want to do and balancing those things and just like seeing this strong thing is like I do I want that so much and like can I do that like can we do that is this are we, are we here now that's really interesting. I mean, uh, personally, whenever like for my characters, I always make my characters like eight foot tall orc ladies with like M cup boobs and like, I'm always like making my characters over sex uh, uh, and really sexy. So this whole Resident people. Evil thing is not a new thing for you. No, I, no, it. that's okay. why I, people were like adding me because it was up <laughs> my alley. <laughs> See this because this is you. Um, uh, and so, and so, uh, you know, that, that whole thing, I, um, really, really enjoy. I, I love, um, uh, I'm a burlesque performer uh, outside of this. Obviously I haven't done that in a while because yeah. Um, uh, but uh, that's sort of a depiction and I always go back and forth, right? But as a, as a woman, I feel like one as a woman of color and also as a woman of color of size, my body is always sort of scrutinized. It's always, I'm always sort of sexualized against my will. Yeah. I can't wear hardly anything without someone finding it inappropriate in some sort of a way, you know, can't wear a tube top, spaghetti straps or anything like that would sell somebody being like, you're, you're dressed inappropriately. Um, and so I think the fact that this is a woman of color who is a woman of color of size being like, no, this is the depiction that I want to have for myself is is the decision of choice and if you believe yeah. in choice for women uh, for for if you believe in in sort of the tenets of feminism which is that women have the right to choose what they want to be and how they want to be then you also are okay with this and i think for a very long time like you were saying emma 
our mentality has been like, if you want to be taken seriously, if you are like, you're tough, you want to achieve, you want to be, uh, you know, uh, at the top of your field, you sort of have to defeminize yourself. Mm. Uh, and I feel like now we're getting into this sort of thing of being like, I can be a powerful, uh, amazing, badass woman and still be in full makeup with my boobs out in high heels. And it doesn't take away anything about like my rights or my, my power as a woman or how strong I am. Um, but this is all in the context of women choosing themselves and not in the sort of larger frame of like, you know, because I just know that someone is going to be like, well, yeah, I'm going to have my character also have big mommy milkers and it's equality. It's feminism. And it's just like, no, there's a there is a history and a context that you have to sort of frame this in. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I grew up on Red Sonia. Uh, she's she's one of my favorite uh, characters um, and Red Sonia is in a chain metal bikini. Uh, she is half naked defeating dinosaurs with a big sword and stuff like that. And it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, but I, I think that now that there's more Red Sonia comic books written by women, they've been able to sort of subvert that male gaze. Um, and I think that that's really where we're at now. Um, but quite frankly also we have to say the show is not for children they, yeah. they also should have done a better job of saying that like this show is is kind of like i don't know if you guys remember crank anchors exactly. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> crank anchors <laughs> that's also i'm having a lot of like things that i haven't remembered for 10 years <laughs> flooding back to me today um crank anchors or even like the harley quinn show which is like an animated uh adult comedy uh the show is kind of targeted towards that it's more of an adult sort of a thing and i don't think that they made that very clear that it is supposed to be a more mature adult comedy kind of a thing uh and i wish yeah there's there's a lot of things that i think that they could have been a little bit better about but also i will say this and maybe this is a little controversial uh there's so much to be worried about in this world yeah exactly. uh, <laughs> we've got so much going on and like democracy is at stake every day there's a pan a pan pizza happening outside like, <laughs> there's so much going on and y'all really have to be upset about these big felt fabric gazongas i just i don't know i i think it's funny it is serious but at the same time like really y'all really uh Get, get over it get you know so yeah that's it that's all I have to say thank you Derek for allowing me to rant about big um <laughs> mu Muppet mommy milkers well you you clearly had a lot to share a lot to <laughs> get off your chest uh, you're canceled <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> well on other related, not really related news, but news that uh, does matter to us now that we are, of course, stuck in a pandemic and everyone is leaning more to uh, simulated experiences. Emma, what about simulated experiences do you know about? <laughs> so Tabletop Simulator is a platform that I use a lot professionally and a lot of people use for entertainment, being able to play board games online. So they've had an incredible period of growth that no one could have foresaw before this. And they are trying to localize into different languages. So the way they decided to go about that was to use um, just cutting edge technology. I mean, what could possibly be a better way to translate between human languages than by using a computer? namely Google Translate, uh, because I'm sure we've all played around with that and know that it's absolutely infallible in its translation between mm. different languages. That, that was sarcasm. That's not oh. actually <laughs> the truth. <laughs> I just have a very straight face when I'm saying that. Uh, no, understandably, notably, it was pretty much a disaster for uh, translating two different languages. They attempted to translate all their menus so that they could localize their content. And there's just kind of an outpouring of this was a terrible idea. What made you think that this was going to be OK? I mean, it's really, it's just 
self-centered, culture-centered, language-centered to think that this would work because different languages have different words for things that you can't just transpose. So they had stuff for uh, like chess pieces, right? The white bishop character. It's like the bishop character in French in chess has a completely different name that's not just translating the word bishop or jigsaw. They use the word instead of a jigsaw puzzle, they use the word for jigsaw, which is a tool uh, bonsai, I'm sure that you're very familiar with this, that you use to cut wood into different shapes. So it's just the complete, it's a picture of a jigsaw, but the word is completely different. And as probably a mostly American audience and maybe not having to deal much with languages of other cultures, it's, people make jokes about it. If it's like, it's not really funny if this is a tool we're trying to use and you don't take the time and effort to pay people to translate things. Cause they had mentioned like, oh, if you see any translations that are bad, just tell us about it. It's like, okay, you're outsourcing that work to your community, which Tabletop Simulator does. And they get around, all, they kind of skirt a lot of rules with that. Cause a lot of people just put up board games even without the rights to them on Tabletop Simulator. Yep. So. It's a little tough for me. It is a tool that I use that I, there's other tools as well, but it's like the most common tool in our industry to do our job right mm -hmm. now. But there's definitely ways that they could be handling things better. Well, hopefully they'll actually take some of that response and feedback to heart and change that. Yeah. Um, until then, you can see the ridiculous ways they have mistranslated things. Like I think it was like press seven to bread. Like what? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, that just means that they have to improve later on and we have to just wait to see if they own up to those improvements or not, we'll have to see. Uh, in later news, guess what? You know, not only is February known for Black History Month, but, on you know, that's more important, but also related to tabletop related news is that February is also Zine Quest time. So we're going to go ahead and impress, like go through really fast what zines grabbed us this week. So it's time to get in the zine zone, Derek. All right. Well, welcome to the zine zone uh, with a project that is 100% perfect for Derek. It is called Low Stakes. It has 11 days left. It's what we do in the shadows the rules light rpg in a zine you're in a sitcom you're a vampire you're pretty much incompetent uh stumble your way through life yeah like seems perfect for a one shot like yeah i'll absolutely buy a short zine like this pack it in a bag bring it around uh and bust it out when my friends want to play something and we don't want to think too hard uh okay low stakes perfect for me um and then also with 11 days left, uh, Tuesday, February 16th, Weirdwood. Uh, basically, it's a narrative role-playing game of dreams and nightmares and the darkness in between. Uh, it's an urban a narrative urban fantasy RPG where like, basically you are members of a secret society and you have to protect everyone uh, from the mysterious... Like, so I couldn't get much details whether or not this is a alternate layer on top of the universe or is like just a thing that exists that not everyone can see. Uh, so you, the idea is that uh, based on like how, you know, what you dream about nightmares and your imagination, uh, like it, sometimes it gets so strong that it actually takes form in the real world. And every like session, every game, uh, players create a new and unique version of what they call the weird wood, which doesn't necessarily have to be a wood. It just is the name for an area that basically is concentration of human thoughts, beliefs, and understanding and it like to manifest in their city. Uh, it uses a collaborative uh, shared dice pool to like motivate players to introduce like instead of the GM doing most of the work of doing encounters, you kind of sabotage yourself in order to get more dice. Um, and so if that kind of idea, like, you know, that narrative kind of RPG really appeals to you also with the whole idea that like what you imagine, what you're like, the human beliefs are like gods themselves are all real. It's just that the concentration of belief is what actually brings them to life. Then Weirdwood is going to be the game for you. Great. And continuing the trend of 11 days left, I feel the need to note that not every zine that I picked is related to vampires, but this one is. 
as Blood Heist is, hey, Dracula won and established an empire. And now there's a bunch of vampire nobles who scheme it against each other and hire other vampires to commit heists on them in secret or something like that. So it's it's billing itself as the usual suspects uh, meets Bloodborne uh, and it's vampires and it's heists. And I can't get the idea of Shadowrun, but everyone is a vampire out of my head. Uh, so again, a, a cute, weird little zine idea, uh, and it's got vampires and crime. So I'm in. Mm-hmm. That's Blood Heist, 11 days. All right. And the next zine we have for you with 12 days left, Wednesday, February, February 17th, is Bucket of Bolts. So this one I actually just backed like immediately. Uh, I'm a big fan of Artifact, and these are from the same creators of Artifact, which is a uh, like, it's the whole idea for this one, Bucket of Bolts, is that you role play as a spaceship being transferred to like different captains throughout like your age so if you like the idea of like serenity and um millennium falcon you would really love this game because you are Mm. the ship you're like you know something has lived long enough that it grows a personality and it grows like you know like the whole story is just based on your experience um uh you take you know it's just like telling a story of like this being passed down from hand to hand to hand and how the spaceship develops as his own character. Uh, one of the really cool notes about this is that this game is going to be printed in a, a beak zine, which is basically, it's a way that they, they, they have the paper and they fold it in such a way. Cause you know, usually zines are just like two papers fold in like clack, clack. Um, what are these stapled stapled Saddle together? Fish. Yeah. Uh, And uh, instead of that, they use like a really cool form of like origami, I guess. Uh, And they were able to print it in such a way that they fold it into an H page booklet on one single sheet of paper. Um, And then the reverse side of it is used as a one page reference sheet for the game itself. So you got the rules on one side and a one page reference on the other side. And uh, because of the beak zines, like design is very, very well appreciated, like, you know, well received. They're actually going to be reprinting uh, artifacts uh, in the same way, kind of just redesigning artifacts because artifacts is a little heftier um, of a game uh, Yeah, that uh, they have to like redesign their past game artifacts. So if you like those kind of ideas, unfortunately, you can't get the special edition anymore because they're all sold out. Uh, I know that because I really wanted to get the special edition and they're all sold out. It makes me sad. Why well, have a limited amount of copies? But it's well, okay. Maybe, it's fine. I wait. Maybe you'll meet them at a con and they'll have some there. Ooh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. So hope, keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. But yes. Uh, the next project that excited me has nine days left. And this is Power Words Engine. And really, this just comes from playing Mage the Ascension when I was young really made me love and appreciate alternate weird magic systems. So this one, uh, you basically know a certain amount of words and you can combine those words in different ways to have different effects. And it is very reminiscent of Ars Magica. In Ars Magica, you have a verb and a noun and you kind of build almost a sentence. Uh, in this one though, the words have relations to each other and you have kind of like a, 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 an arcane chart that allows you to go back and forth between them uh, to kind of see what connects to what, um, to kind of build a whole new magic system. Uh, So short, interesting, different magic system, uh, really intriguing, nine days left. All right. So folks, uh, oh, by the way, uh, we're gonna be doing some things, uh, oh, no, no, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and lead straight in because we got a lot of stuff that we're gonna be doing today. Derek's, can you please tell us about the bundles today? Derek, bundle box. We have have three more uh, zine quests. Oh, whoops, 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 my bad. Okay, I totally skipped that, my bad, sorry. That's fine, that's fine. Uh, so, uh, Emma, you didn't want to go over yours? You want to skip that one? Uh, yeah, we're running a little short in time, so okay. I'm happy Great. to... Sure. So then the last two zine quests that we just wanted to bring attention to were The Vast and the Dark, uh, which if anybody has read the Blame manga or watched the anime, it's you know the idea that you're kind of exploring this almost infinite uh, superstructure, this uh, huge infrastructure that you're exploring that's weird and alien and far beyond human scale. 
So a quick zine to kind of run through that, and it's using D&D 5th edition rules, so people should be pretty familiar with it. Sounds very intriguing to me. And then finally, seeing uh, Sharon Biswas's name come up again, there's a zine called Nerves that is about uh, articles and kind of critical analyses of RPGs that is um, uh, you know, focusing on, on RPGs as an art, less talking about their mechanics and more of them as a, a medium for expression or so. And uh, that has 10 days left, nerves. And those are the Kickstarters of this week that we are uh, kind of most excited about. So Bonsai had to step away. Uh, so we are going to jump into bundles as she uh, alluded to just before she stepped away. There are four bundles this week, two on Humble Bundle, two on Bundle of Holding. So on Humble Bundle, the first one is another Asthma Day digital tabletop video game adaptation bundle. You get uh, up to $141 worth of different video games, uh, adaptations of board games for $10 at the maximum level. Uh, it includes Terraforming Mars, Blood Rage, Lord of the Rings Adventure Card Games, Small World, Pandemic, Love Letter, Ticket to Ride, Splendor, and a Game of Thrones. So like some of these bundles we've had before, this is very much if you don't already have a collection of tabletop games in your Steam library, this is a way to build one. The other bundle on Humble Bundle is a multi-language Tales of Warhammer bundle. This is 18 different uh, Warhammer novels, some Age of Sigmar, some 40K, some Horse Heresy, some new, some old, uh, kind of a smattering all around the board. You get 18 novels for up to $18, $200 worth, but notably each of them comes in three versions. You get the English, the French, and the German. So if you are multilingual or no other fans, then uh, you uh, can back this and share them around with people. Bundle of Holding has two quick bundles. Um, there's the Dragon Age and Fantasy Age bundle, which is uh, a re-release of a bundle they had in 2018. And this covers for the $10 uh, tier, you get Fantasy Age, the base book. You get uh, you know, a monster book, a GM kit, some encounters. You can level up to $25 where you get the Dragon Age RPG, which I imagine is going to hit in the heart for a lot of people. Uh, you get some adventure in a GM kit, and then it has Titan's Grave, which is Will Wheaton's setting that came out for it, if anybody recalls the stream that he did for that back in the day. Then they also have uh, the Expanse RPG and Modern Age um, bundle, and that was back in December 2020 when they first launched that, so they're bringing that back as well. The starter level for that at $10 too has... Modern Age, which is kind of like D20 Modern, kind of just current era RPG rules. It provides a dimension hopping setting for that. The companion, some antagonists, missions, and the GM kit. And then for $30, there's the level up level or, or tier that has the Expanse RPG itself, along with the GM kit and a bunch of adventures for that. So, you know, the bundle of holding is two ones um, kind of coming back from the past. Uh, and then the Humble Bundle has those two new ones. So there's plenty of stuff to check out now if you want to grab some stuff and save some money. And then finally, most of our attention this week on Kickstarter has been for ZineQuest. But we do have a handful of just normal Kickstarters that we wanted to draw people's attention to. Uh, so Isabella, sounds like you have a couple Kickstarters you really want to share with us. Yeah, so if you're a fan of the Morkborg adventures, which I absolutely love just being able to say Morkborg, uh, Tower of Scoundrels has four days left. Uh, Tower of Scoundrels is a seven inch vinyl record of what they call atmospheric tunes that you can use uh, to play in this sort of the Tower of Scoundrels. Uh, it's really cool. It's music and it's atmospheric. You can use the cover of the vinyl in order to use it as a GM screen. Uh, and it's just a short little, if you already have the Morkborg uh, set up, then you can just use this as sort of a supplementary tool in order to do another adventure in the world. I think this is really cool because I love anything that sort of in, includes music as an element of how mm. to play the game. Uh, you do have to have a vinyl record if you're a hipster like me. Uh, who has a vinyl record player and a vinyl collection, you do need that in order to play along with this. So that is Tower of Scoundrels, a third party Morkborg adventure with four days left. Uh, my next one that I have uh, that I'm very excited to talk about 
as Dungeon Bitches, mm -hmm. a queer TTRPG with nine days left. Uh, this one is a really cool uh, RPG uh, in which you are a group of disaster lesbians. Uh, and um, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse actually uh, <laughs> on this. I know that I'm pushing it really today. Um, but um, so uh, it's a game, uh, they say about uh, queer women banding together. It's about trauma, it's about community, it's about pain, it's about survival. But most of all, it's very, very gay. Uh, and this game uh, is a really awesome kind of hardcore um, uh, in its subject matter, uh, there is a warning that the game does include gore, nudity, and sexuality. Um, but, you know, it's all about uh, a bunch of badass lesbians trapped in a dungeon playing, uh, and it looks really incredible. And I like this kind of take no prisoners, hardcore metal aspect of this game, uh, because I don't think there's anything more metal than being queer. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that is Dungeon Bitches with nine days left check it out great Derek? well then to round out our kickstarters we have a couple kickstarters that are adaptations of existing or older games to new systems uh, and then we have something new or a, a new version or a new expansion so we have iron kingdoms coming out for dnd fifth edition so if anybody has been playing the war machine hordes uh tabletop game or they played the old iron kingdoms rpg when it was his own system it's now getting a DD fifth edition rule set uh if you've been playing DD and you want a steampunk setting with a lot of conflicts and a lot of strong magic and you want to be that person who has like a gun and it shoots magic bullets and stuff like that then iron kingdoms is there for you so they have a plan to release a core book with the rules a monster manual effectively and then an adventure um I'm hoping that this will really finally be Iron Kingdom's chance to shine because I think there's a lot of really interesting ideas to play with there that I really hope an RPG would give it space to mess around with. That has six days left, uh, so you're going to want to get on that. And then the other adaptation with 10 days left is Pathfinder for Savage Worlds, which is a very weird idea to me, but it seems to be very popular and a lot of people are very excited about it. They're releasing uh, an adaptation of the Pathfinder core rules, core idea world for the Savage Worlds actual rule set. And then further, they're adapting the first or the one of the most prominent um, uh, Pathfinder kind of arcs, basically, the uh, Rise of the Rune Lords for Savage Worlds system. So if you are a big fan of Savage Worlds and you are real excited uh, about, or you, you really want to play like epic fantasy, it looks like they're going to try to put some peanut butter and chocolate together here for you. There's a couple different box sets in there, lots of um, cards and bennies and poker chips and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so check that out. You got 10 days left for Pathfinder and Savage Worlds. Um, I just know enough Savage Worlds fans out there that if we don't tell you about it and you find out about it later, you will be very sad. Then finally, the last project I want to talk about is Tinker Turf. They have seven days left on their sci-fi terrain. And this is just, if you play a lot of miniatures games and you want to get a lot of terrain and you don't want to spend a ton of money on it, this is flat packed, self-assembled, full color, effectively chipboard terrain. You punch out the terrain you glue it together. It's pretty solid and sturdy. They've got pictures of it holding up piles of books. Um, and it looks really good. You don't have to paint it. Uh, it's not going to be, you know, necessarily as, as physically detailed as some plastic molded stuff. But especially for scattered terrain, in a lot of cases, it's going to work very, very well. So if you're looking for cheap terrain that looks good because it's still full color, uh, check out Tinker Turf. It's got seven days left. And those are our Kickstarters for this week. Well, folks, guess what? That is the end of Table Takes. But wait, 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 wait. Don't leave everybody, huh? No, no, I mean, sorry, sorry. But before we uh, get into our... I want you guys to stick around because I'm sorry, it's not the end of Table Takes. It's actually, we have... Uh, we're going to go ahead and switch over real quick because we have a special guest this uh, evening, Grant Hewitt, uh, who... If you don't know, uh, designer Spire, Heart, and Honey Heist, and a lot of really fun, amazing micro RPGs is going to be here uh, and, 
and talking about uh, the process, his like creative process and everything like that. And uh, it's going to be really fun. Uh, and Derek and I are going to be here uh, interviewing that. And also, if you stick around, speaking of a heart, uh, followed right after that at 4 p.m. Pacific time, uh, we are actually going to be playing the heart RPG, uh, GM'd by Derek. And then I, myself, Isabella, Javion, and Jordan ha- are going to be uh, joining us. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, our ski, our streaming schedule, by the way, if you guys don't know, this is all Pacific time. We're more than just table talks here at uh, Monday at 6 PM board games with the brothers Murph Wednesday. We got one 30. This game gets dicey. And of course, Friday, you get us 2 PM table takes. Remember to follow, like subscribe and turn on all your notifications. And also, Hey, you want to talk to us more, join our discord and uh, tell us about it. Uh, so folks just hang on real tight. We're going to switch over real quick uh, while we get everything organized so we can go ahead and do this really cool interview. I hope you guys stick around. It's going to be fun. Hey, everybody. Thank you for sticking around during that break. We uh, released Emma and Isabella so they can return to their normal lives. And we pulled Grant in uh, so that he could join Bonsai and I and talk a little bit about uh, Spire, some other stuff you're doing, but specifically about Heart, because that's what we're going to be playing later today. So, Grant, do you want to uh, kind of summarize your background or talk about some of the yeah. things you've designed or how people might know you? Yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy that. Uh, so, so, so this this channel asked me to write a brief bio for myself before before I went on, and I mentioned I mentioned all these games I wrote, and that was really good. But the thing you really focused in on was Biscuit Lover, which which I really like. Which was kind of like, hey, who's this Biscuit Lover over here, huh? But yeah, <laughs> it, I like it does a, sound like a euphemism. I like a biscuit, certainly. Um, I wrote Spire and Heart, which are sort of big, weighty books about either revolution or tragic uh, obsession. But I also wrote a lot of fun games like Honey Heist, Crash Pandas, um, Jason Statham's Big Vacation, nice uh, which is nice Marines. Yes, um, many many fine games which started off with a pun and really got out of hand. And uh, I release one of those uh, every month for free through our Patreon, which is nice because um, it means I get paid to do stuff for free, which is kind of exciting. Well, yeah, kind of. It's exciting. Um, I, I live and work in East London. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, do, 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 doing my ideal job broadly. How it's did you get cool. started in a lot of this work? Like, how did, how did you decide that oh. making a constant stream of weird RPGs was going to be your thing? Um, well, I'm largely unemployable. Which was a bit of a challenge. I, I don't really fit well into normal employment because I, I have problems with capitalism sure, in a lot sure. of ways. And so, and like, and like, basically, once I realize my boss is trying to make more money out of me uh, than than I get, I start to get angry. Uh, and the only thing I've ever really <laughs> been good at is writing role playing games. So, sure. um, with endless support from my partner Mary, who's also one third of our business, Rowan, Rick, and Deckard. Um, mm-hmm both in terms of emotional, but also professional and crucially monetary support. Um, well, I have, I've, I've had, the, had the capacity to have a career in this. Um, I used to be a games journalist, so I kind of know how to write a bit and I've got a degree in it. But my, my first passion's always been making games mechanics and systems and giving building machines that give people the opportunity to tell stories. I think that's really exciting. I have a lot of fun doing that. What were some of the games that you kind of either grew up on or grew into the industry on? Oh, I didn't really, I didn't really start playing games until I went to university. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was, all, I always, I was always fascinated by role playing games, but I grew up in the countryside in Portugal, uh, which is there was not not a huge role playing scene. Um, really? No, yeah, no, yeah, not not even not even the populated part of Portugal. I don't, I don't speak <laughs> Portuguese, so it was a real challenge for me to play role playing games growing up. But I used to, I used to read a lot. The first game I ever played, first game I ever ran, was a game called Zaibatsu, which I got from an Angel Fire website, mm-hmm. uh, which is, um, which which is which is charming. Um, uh, since then, I think the first thing I played, I played a lot of Slay Industries when I was in, when I was in university, um, which taught me a lot about cruelty to players i've played a lot of dungeons and dragons every edition you know soups and nuts i've played that um i think the biggest inspiration for me as a game designer was looking at um, dogs in the vineyard uh Deepens and baker's um game uh just in terms of being able to uh to see a game which was about one thing and one mm-hmm. thing only and just telling that story incredibly well and for me that was a real eye-opener 
uh, because it meant that I didn't have to try and write a game which did everything. I could just write mm -hmm. a game which was just about bears doing a crime, and that was and that was very exciting for me. That that opened up a lot of uh, a lot of doors. I think. I think well, Dogs in the Vineyard was a watershed game for for a lot of designers. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, speaking about like how you're, you're talking about Honey Heist, like how does it feel to basically like put something out there that is that one page RPG and then it has like you know just suddenly just like. <laughs> like take off like what's what's your feeling on that it's you know? really great to have written the only indie rpg it's really good as far of, as far as a lot of tabletop streams are um and, and podcasts are, are considered this sorry so there's a running gag that um <laughs> that big podcasts basically play dungeons and dragons and then they play honey heist once and that's kind of their indie tax <laughs> But um, it was, uh, it's the thing I, I put it out and it was fun. Um, I'm, like mechanically, I'm quite proud of it. I, I think it's quite good um, from, uh, from a design point of view, but it was really um, uh, Marisha Ray picked it up for Critical Role. And she was, she, she was incredibly kind. She, like, she, she sent me a message on Twitter and she was like, hi, I'm thinking of running your game uh, uh, on, on my stream. Do you have any advice? I'm like, oh, she seems nice. I'll look, I'll look up who she is. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't realize. Um, but, uh, she's been really cool about promoting it, about saying, Hey, this, the, this is the game. This is the guy who wrote the game. Go back his patron. And a significant amount of our, of, of our business's success is thanks to Marisha just being cool and telling people who we are. So I, uh, yeah, it's, it's been interesting. It, like for a while there was, um, I feel that I was kind of at the forefront of something for a little while in making strange, scratchy one-page role-playing games, and we've diverted from that. I think I think that's, uh, on a Reddit thread, someone referred to it as the Grant Howe era, and I was like, oh, I had an era, oh. and, it, and, and it's over. <laughs> you only find out about your era once it has passed. Like that's that's the rule. You can't yeah, enjoy yeah. it while it's going on. Yeah, and, and, and I, I can't say that I'm having an era. I think it's a bit like saying I'm cool. Someone else has to say I'm cool. Someone younger has to say I'm cool, I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, like with that directional change, because you you mm. you you also you went from these like new all these independent like kind of fun silly like uh, single mm. page or like RPGs, and then suddenly you're diving into more of like you know heart and spire kind of things. Like, so what was like your process to like you know thinking about like taking these two different dynamics of something diving deep and something going up and rising with social issues? Like, mm. how did you like essentially process like? this so, switch spire and heart are i think the artistic games that i want to write it was a uh, I, I actually had a um it's it's very cliched but i uh, there was there was a, i i had kind of a drug fueled vision around a bonfire in the jungle in costa rica in 2016 <laughs> it, it, it was it was on this it was on this creatives retreat i was lucky enough to get into it and like the entire week weekend I was there, I was like, oh no, I don't get this. I'm not an artist, blah, 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 blah. Something happened in that jungle. I don't know what, but I came out of it and I was like, oh, I can make art. I'm an artist, I get it. And so, um, and so Spire was from that. Before Spire, I was always really careful to not put setting in my games or to have it vaguely alluded to or through a table or something along those lines. Whereas after this vision affair, I had burning a list of my fears in the jungle. I, um, I I was like actually I I'm confident enough to say this is the setting this is the story I want to tell, and so from that we were able to um, I was able to, to take that confidence and work with Chris Taylor who's my co-author on all big all, all big games and most short ones except he he doesn't like the spotlight he doesn't like being recognised or um, seen so I get to just sort of lap up all that spare praise which is quite nice. Probably good we, for you. Uh, it's oh yeah, it's great. It, it fills the yawning void in my chest where a heart would be, <laughs> and um, so um, the the one page games are much more about me sort of letting off steam, having an idea for a mechanic I want to play with, something which is like it's only this only has to hold together for two and a half hours, and then it's and mm -hmm. then it's over, and mm -hmm. so they're quite they're um, they're quite experimental and snacky. They're almost kind of like um, like shockwave games. Uh, if, if, oh, uh, yes, uh, flash. Flash, mm -hmm. uh, I don't be shot again. So they're quite scrappy, and then Spire and Heart are much more like. Here's like I I think it would be good to overthrow the government. I think it is good to die in a certain way and take about these things and channel them into games about people with pointy ears. Well, that was one of the things interesting things that struck me about kind of a contrast between Spire mm -hmm. and Heart, in that Spire is 
ex- like an extremely political game. Like you mm-hmm. are part of the resistance in an occupied city mm-hmm. under a explicitly racist regime. Mm-hmm. And then when you came out with Heart, you ex- you specifically took a, t- a moment to kind of talk about that's what happens in Spire. Like mm-hmm. the racism, the oppression happens in Spire. Yeah, you don't have to bring that to Heart, and we recommend that you don't bring that to Heart. Um, and then when you presented different ancestries, you also didn't provide them any mechanical benefit. You said mm. they're all people and yeah. they have cultural differences, but that's it. Um, yeah. What, I and mean, I'm, I'm curious what made you decide to do that and then discuss that in that way in heart. Yeah, sure. Um, we wanted heart to be, uh, one of the things which we've been really careful with um, in, in role-playing games uh, when we write them in terms of ancestry, in terms of uh, species and race, is that we didn't want to have, oh, one race is naturally better at one thing than another. Mm-hmm. Like, we really wanted to get away from essentialism. I'm fine with saying, um, round, round this neck of the woods, a load of people who are human are raised in this way, and so they, they are culturally inclined towards this sort of thing, and that's, that's okay. But we figured actually far better than like f- the biggest thing which you want to avoid is monoculturalism. Mm-hmm. I think that it's it's lazy and it's boring. And to have um, uh, all high elves are French, it's like well, it's 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 a little bit shady. And so um, we wanted to give you like much in the same way that heart is um there's a box out which has here is here is what you need to know and then everything else you're making up as you go along and you're extrapolating and adding things in and blending it it's like there are four um ancestries of four different kinds of people who come down into heart and they look different um here's 20 different cues for things that that they might have and you can infer your own culture from this you can play as hard as you like um and I think we wanted to we wanted to give that to the players and to the GM and let them infer that culture. Um, it's in like we, it's really boring playing uh, having another racist elf in a game. And so we we just wanted to sort of get in ahead and say, actually, listen, don't don't play that. You can play that, but it's boring. What like like pl- play an elf here who's pushing against that play or like don't discuss that. But yeah, it's I I. I Ever since Half Orcs got a uh, got an intelligence bonus, sorry, got an intelligence deficit in in uh, in in D anD D, it sort of opened my eyes, and I was like, oh, I see. So paladins are just state sanctioned warlocks, are they? And then you start to get a bit sort of, you know, smash the state. <coughs> so you wanted to get you want, we wanted to get rid of as much as that as possible. Okay, well, I mean, that also kind of ties into the the question of, um, or the, I guess the broader question of, how did you decide to. Or, or why did you decide to pivot so strongly in kind of theme and structure and execution from Spire to Heart? You know, they share mm. the same world, they share the same mechanics, mm. but you wouldn't, I don't think anybody would really describe them as the same game uh, no, or even just two sides no. of the same coin. So, no. you know, what was the, you know, I, I think the comparison, you know, Bonds I had here in our notes was, you know, alien versus aliens. Yeah, and that's a big yes. shift, but both are there. They're together. They're in the same family. I'm, I'm very flattered at that because I love Alien and Aliens. <laughs> well, yeah, um, for, <laughs> for very different reasons. And like, mm-hmm. I, I think when, when I was younger, I was like, oh no, Aliens the superior film because because it's a horror film. And no, actually, no, they're both good. Um, we wanted to write uh, an OSR game. We wanted to write a game which talked about we're like we think dungeon crawling is really cool until you do it. And then when you actually go through the numbers and like you're like, oh, okay, I've got 12 arrows. Oh, I've got this many healing potions. Oh, there's eight goblins down this corridor. It gets really bogged down in, um, it, it nickels and dimes you. And so what we mm-hmm. want to do is take the idea of Spire, which is effectively the resistance system powers these sort of, what's the word? Uh a, a, like a cluster bomb disasters as everything goes wrong and you try and fix it and everything oh, oh, goes it's wrong. Oh, it's a and cascading <laughs> effect, I guess. Cascading, thank you, yes. that's the word. Yeah. Yes, yes, I had cataclysm, which isn't quite right. Um, it powers these, these cascading disasters. And so we want to try and take the idea of not saying, okay, I've got this much water and, I'm, and I've got rules for running out of water, but we're like, cool, what happens when you run out of water? What happens when you get lost? What happens when you get surrounded? And so we want to take all of the exciting bits from a dungeon crawl and then mechanically push them into something which abstracted out all the stuff at the front. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we set it under the spire because because people would buy it. 
Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, and I, it's fun to explore the world as well. Like, I'm really happy with what we've done with her. I think it's 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 tragic in a way which I which I didn't expect going into it, and I'm really uh, happy with what we've managed to build. <laughs> yeah, with with that kind of like the ideas of those like mechanics of like you know like when I've heard about like when I heard Heart being announced, I, like I don't know if you're familiar with Darkest Dungeon, the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was really, like, this yeah. is Darkest yeah. Dungeon on tabletop, so it's like, yeah. is, what is like the immediate inspiration that you got for Heart? Just like other than of course just taking those dungeon Darkest calling dungeon. aspects. Darkest Dungeon, obviously. Um, yeah. uh, you will come to know the tra the, the tragic extent of, 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 of my betrayal, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Well, Bloodborne for the aesthetic, and again, the fact that every, like, in Bloodborne, from what I can tell, everyone's just trying to do their best and it's all gone wrong, <laughs> which that's that's something which I really like in games. Um, Necromunda, um, like continuing on from from Spire, so there's, there's the sort of the, the underhive there. Um, and uh, crucially, Annihilation. Uh, I read, I read the, I read the book um, many moons ago, and I was like, "Wow, well, I, I, I should write a game based on this." I don't think I've read, I don't think I've written a book, I've read a book since, uh, <laughs> which, which is really that's my own downfall, and I should get around to it. But I was really inspired by the way that uh, Vandermeer uh, talked about the encroachment of of another world into our own. And that is broadly hard. Like where the Deep Apiarist has a whole set of powers and they're just named after, uh, they're all quotes from Annihilation. We really, uh, we really like showing our working. Well, you did list it in the, the Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. so it's not like you were quite hiding it, uh, but yeah. I, I, I thought we'd listed Darkest Dungeon as well, but I, I, th I, th I think, think we left it at the first, yeah. <clears throat> okay. It's an excuse to talk it. about it again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's it's great, yeah. We're into it, and I, I think as well the character classes as well. And like, it's not a fighter in Darkest Dungeon, but there's the Aqua mm. or there's the the Vestal or what have you. So it's very much telling you something about the world with the classes, which we want to do as well. Um, I guess like with that saying, can you give us any new hints about maybe some new projects like bubbling up in the surface between you? You know, yeah, your yeah, yeah. brains. <laughs> between our little brains we have <laughs> on me we have um so we've got a spire source book coming out um we're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna be going to kickstarter probably uh, spring yeah. spring yeah. it's yeah. it's mostly it's mostly written we've got a load of new we've got a load of authors in some of them new some of them established um <clears throat> we've got some really cool scenarios in there um one which uh is is the maltese falcon but what if the maltese falcon could summon a demonic incursion uh, and so it sort of goes from there. Um, it deals with religion and crime and order as the three um, <clears throat> the three domains, which is really really cool. Um, we we're gonna do something with heart. We want to keep supporting it, uh, but at present, uh, Chris and I are feeling a little bit a little bit burned out on 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 the world of Destera, which is where Heart and Spire are set. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to try we wanted to try to do something else for a bit, which wasn't using the resistance system. We do have plans for Destera. We want to do a game set in the in the wars to the Southlands. So there's like there's a, there's kind of tr trench and mountain warfare going on um, in between the High Elves and the Knolls. So we want to do a game about that. Um, but at the moment, we're work I'm working on something called 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 Hollows or the Hollows, which is about it's monster hunting, and it's incredibly grim. Uh, it's it's like it's like uh, it's. Uh, we it's it's it, it's it's about limping towards a basilisk with a with with a gut wound pulling yourself oh. in and then sort of stabbing it as as, as it dies and bathing I yourself in its blood. You're seducing Derek as you speak right now. You're it's entirely saying. possible, uh, but I, I do love how you say, "Well, we were we were a little burned out on this dystopia, so we decided to go make a grim." Uh, and gritty game about you know losing at the very point oh of victory. My, oh my god! Like, yeah, like sure. that's, 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 that's the thing, great. mate. Mate, if, if you think spies are dystopia, you should you can't wait till you see Hollows. Hollows is about climate change. Great, <laughs> sign me up. Yeah, man. yeah. There you go. Whatever uh, I'm angry well, about this year. <laughs> another, another project that uh, I think you you just have released recently was the reprint of Unbound. Mm. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Copy. Uh, no. Um, so Unbound was the game we put out before Spire. Um, and this was back before we were really established as a business. We didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so mechanically, it's sound. 
um, and the reprint really just uh, it collates some some like some little source books we had and some extra content and, and corrects some some uh, so, so it tightens up the wording but mechanically it's the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, Un- Unbound is the game I wrote when I was uh, terrified about telling people my setting that I had. So it is a pulp um, rules light, I suppose, action game. But the idea is that it comes with session zero world building in it. There's a series mm-hmm. of questions you ask. So while while you're building your characters, the GM's building the world and vice versa. And you always like you you generally end up with science fantasy. There's, there's generally a mech suit. Usually there's a zeppelin there. I didn't. I don't. It's not my responsibility. It, it just happens when you give people <laughs> when you give people free reign. They mm-hmm. they they like what if a sword right? But it was technical. Like, it had lasers. Perfect. Fine. Whatever, mate. Yeah, go. And so people have a great deal of fun with that. It's got a really snacky combat system. We were playing a lot of the Secret World MMO when we were writing it. So, like, there's a lot about positioning, a lot about sort of um, pulling aggression and getting yourself lined up in fun combinations. Um, But really, um, I, I don't like saying it, but I think it gives the best session zero of any game I've played. It does, it gives a bold an, claim. It gives that, an, that is a very, yeah. very bold game. It gives yeah. an incredible session zero and a serviceable rest of the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite the sales pitch. Uh, yeah, I, I think I backed the, the original Kickstarter you did for that. Mm. Uh, so it was exciting to see that return, yeah. particularly because it was such a, uh, it was very different from yeah. Fire and Heart. And, you know, your yeah. explanation of that was the game that you wrote when you weren't you know, ready to tell people a particular mm. setting explains a whole lot about that. Um, but the, the style, the art, it yeah. still unifies oh. kind of all three games. Yeah, together. yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, we had we had Adrian Stone do the style, do the art for Unbound and Spire, and then we had a chap called called uh, Felix Miol do the art for Heart. Uh, and Felix was Felix was involved from us. Like we, I think it was about eighty percent complete. We sent over the book and. He was involved with us from the ground up. Uh, past that, so uh, like he was like rather than giving him rather than giving him briefs, we just sort of send him over a chapter, and he'd he'd come back to us. It was really cool to be involved with an artist in Sweet. that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, anything else that you want to share about uh, kind of products you're working on or plans uh, you have for the future? Um, plans? I've, well, I just just announced Hollows officially for the first time. You heard it so there's that. Yeah, you heard it oh, here wait. first, folks. This, yeah. Is it actually like we got the scoop? We got you the got the scoop. scoop. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, I, I I just managed to write the core mechanic today, so I'm comfortable. <laughs> to, comfortable to oh, like we got. I think we we broke the the eleventh draft of it today, so I'm comfortable talking about it in public. Congratulations. Um, yes, yeah, so yeah, as um, And I've I really want to write a one page game which has all of all of the results from actions are written down before you start play. So like, so like, it's, it's, it's like, yes, and you catch fire and you just roll those and you have those okay. from the start of the start of the game on a hand of cards and you so play those as you So it's like a permanition kind of thing? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Maybe oh, you just sort right. of swap out cards or something. I don't know. Final that, that, that's maybe RPG. Month. Yeah, Final Destination, the RPG, there you go. Uh, oh, that's, that's, that's a good wrapper, there we go. Thanks, Derek. There you there go. You go. <laughs> that, that, that that's my return payment for giving us the the exclusive scoop on Hollow. Yeah, there you go. Now this is your next project. Final if Disney. anyone's if anyone's <laughs> interested in uh, in downloading any of the games I mentioned, aside from ones which aren't out yet, uh, you can go to rrdgames.com, uh, which which mm-hmm. which has everything. I've, well, not everything I've ever written. The good ones I've written, and some of the bad ones are there. Uh, and you, you can download that. Most of them are free. Most of them are one pages, but you can you, you can come along and get some games. There's all sorts of nice things you can go and take a look at. So yes, do that, please. And I wanted to give you a chance to share your uh, you know kit bashed and modified Warhammer ah, guys. If you, okay, if you've been, you've been sharing those on Twitter. I'll, I'll, I'll oh get my I'll get my biggest one. Oh boy! Ooh. Very cool. But yeah, no, no, that's that. This is exciting. I'm I'm excited. Ooh, let's see, let's see. Oh wow, that is a that is a big one. I need to, I need to put the lights on. Hang on, I, I built lights into this one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, this is, this oh. is next level. Come on, darling. Oh. There we go. Okay, so I don't know it will show up, but it's a um, like she is some sort mm-hmm. of sinner, I presume, and she's been strapped into a giant death robot for the emperor. Mm-hmm. Nice. She's a lesser sinner. She fires the guns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, see? that's what I do in my spare time. I, it, it does light up a little bit, but you can't really see it on camera. But there's a there's a whole a whole thing of fairy lights in there that we, I, we uh, trust. Watched. You. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Grant, thank you very much for staying up late and yeah, putting up with us I'm and to go answering lie down. our questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Bonsai, anything else you want to ask? Uh, I guess, like, is there a, a well, one, we're going to be running a session mm -hmm. of heart tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any advice, at least, you know, to Derek or myself, because mm -hmm. I'm going to be playing the game, you know, mm -hmm. what we can do to, like, lessen the darkness, I guess? No, incre increase the <laughs> increase darkness. The darkness? Yeah. Um, well, if you want to lessen the darkness, um, play a character who makes art about everything. Like everyone in heart makes art all the time. So focus on that and paint things all the time and try to understand that. Derek, now. Okay. Um, hurt them. Yep. And the best way you can hurt them, the best thing is from a chap. Um, oh, I forget the name of the of the chap. I'm very sorry. Uh, but you, you know, you know how fallouts work. You trigger fallouts in mm -hmm. the resistance system. Uh, give the players two fallouts to choose from every time they take fallout and let them pick. Okay, great. Yeah, and that, oh, and that yeah. lets them sort of paint their own nightmare. Yep, yep, uh, yep. Yeah, I, I figured um, the answer of giving them what they want is usually a great way for to let players destroy themselves. Yeah, it turns oh. out actually you wanted to die in a cellar. <laughs> we are the number of heart characters who actually wanted to die in a cellar. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it looks like That's the person strange. who came up with that idea says they're in chat. So, uh... oh, hello. Thank you. It's a really good idea. I'm going to steal it for all my future games. <laughs> yes, I've made up cartoons. There we are. I'll try to uh, try to keep that in mind and deploy that when I'm running it too tonight. Good, good, good. Thank you. For all right. Well, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. We look forward to what you have coming out in the future, and we hope that people check out Spire and Heart and the rest of the Rowan Rook and Deckard uh, catalog. Mm -hmm. Cheers. <laughs> good evening. Have Bye. a good night. Sweet dreams. <laughs>